We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Ancara Mess
by the same token, personally, I like to have a physical uh, touch base with my players as soon as I can after a competition. So in the college environment, if we played on a Saturday, I might bring them in on a fri- uh, excuse me, a Sunday and then give them the Monday off. So the challenge then becomes um, how quickly do you want to see them again and how much time have you had for preparation? But again, to Mark's point of, of self-preparation, what I can say is even in the grassroots level, um, you know, where you feel kind of alone because you're by yourself, all the way up through in America, the collegiate level, very often the head coach is the only full-time employee of the college. Um, so even at the higher, deemed to be higher levels of, of U.S. soccer, very often the coach is, is kind of lone wolf in many of these regards. Yeah, that fits in into one of the um, tools I always um, set up uh, is the um, either using Slack or WhatsApp or any of those other variations where we develop a, a level of relationship and um, culture that straight after the the, um, the game, any competition, that the players do what we call a a hot review, which is pretty much after the game and, and set a time frame. They just put in an evaluation of self, um, other players, and and also coach. And obviously, you need to develop that rapport in order for them to be honest with coach. And the coach does that that also with themselves, with anyone they can find. So it doesn't have to be anybody within their sport. It's just someone they can go, can we touch base? It could be a basketball coach they know that may be in the same um, area. It, doesn't, it could even be in a different country. It doesn't matter. That you go, let's do this against each other. Uh, straight after a game, I'm going to do a hot review on Slack. We're in a little group. We're just us so you can have a listen to how i'm hitting and then what we do is we ask them for sometimes it's 24 hours later is we ask them to do what's called a cold review so the cold review is like now you've had a chance to reflect you're not in the heat of the emotions at the at the time you has anything changed so you do the same type review of self players and then other coaches if you have any but what we're looking for is is there any changes now you've had a chance to reflect now on that cold review if we can if it's an opportunity watch some footage if you have that of course because that that helps but the the difference between that hot review and the cold review can give you a lot of data because we know some coaches can be very very emotionally led in a game and they can be really massively impacted by the scoreline of the performance uh, in a negative way. So that hot review allows them to have a feel of, okay, this is how I'm thinking. And the cold review allows them to reflect on how accurate was I straight after the game. And then I can start looking for any of those disparities. Yeah, uh, let's stay on that one then because, you know, you both, you've both both referenced self-awareness there and obviously the importance of it in the, in the review process. But... What about a coach who is not self-aware and can self-awareness be learned through processes like that or improved? I I think definitely. um, uh, The one thing, I mean, there's ways, if you can find someone to support you, it's always having impartiality is fantastic. It doesn't have to be a coach in the same sport even because you're looking at the coaching, you're not looking at the technical and tactical. Um, But the one thing is I always ask everyone to do, look, just film yourself a couple of sessions even if it's the training environment, and then just watch it back. But instead of watching the players and the technical and tactical, just watch your interaction, what you're saying, how you're saying it, how you're interacting, the engagement of the players, et cetera, et cetera, just to establish a baseline. And even by doing that with no other support, it can really raise your awareness to, oh, my God, is that how I communicate in those moments? So at least there's an awareness built. Now, we don't know then if that's going to have an impact on behavior, but raising awareness to reality has to be the first stage and watching yourself back on a video where you're just looking at your own um the way you communicate your interaction your tonality how you're affected how you're how you're listening all those things is a big game changer in just the self-awareness of what you think you're doing and what you're actually doing and i think that's that's a critical for any coach let's go similar lines then with the staff review for the weekend then and are we as coaches in the in the coaching soccer coaching community, especially Ian? Are we are we overlooking the work done prior to the week? I know you said reference the work done. Is there enough of that going on? Do you feel at the minute? Uh, I think um, I think in the modern game, and, and again all the way down through the grassroots, options of planning um, are much much better than they ever they ever were. Um, so people run around using the term periodization to apply to a whole bunch of different things. But I think in, in some respects, we're just talking about planning, planning the physical load, 
planning the team meetings and the interactions. And I, I think this notion of, of failing to prepare and preparing to fail, I think is not, is not just a trite, uh, a, a trite uh, line. I think it's something that coaches need to be aware of. I think um, sometimes coaches will get through the result on the basis perhaps of good preparation and then forget what went into it because they're now planning for the next competition. And I do think reference to what you've done before, how you've done it, tweaks you've made, informs subsequent planning, informs subsequent performance and potentially outcome. From my perspective, and it was some of the, the notes I made in prep, whatever the head coach and the staff plan and do prior to seeing the players again, um, could be could be contentious, it could be stressful, it could be it could be quite damning in times about certain individual performance. I think what the players see to give the impression that it's prepared and organized and the coach is centered, I think we owe it to our players, even if maybe underneath the surface of the water we're paddling like heck, they have to see a degree of um, steadiness in us. Because at the end of the day, these are young athletes and they're ultimately looking at the, selfishly at their individual performance, the group and the team. And they don't want the distraction of drama from the, the coach or inconsistency from the coach. Mark, anything on that? Yeah, I think it's, um, it, it's linking what uh, Ian was saying there is it's understanding where to find that balance. So there's no question planning is, is far improved and obviously there's technology that can support that. But coaches need to be mindful of planning. You need to be prepared to look at whatever you've planned you need to be able to see what's in front of you and be confident enough to tear up what you've planned and adapt it if required based on what you see in front of them isn't on the track that you thought it would be. But the other key thing is making sure we're looking for trends and we're not just reacting solely to a scoreline of a one-off thing and understanding, okay, we've worked on this in training. What's my expectation in the game of any transfer of the learning and actually, what am I looking for? So we're setting realistic expectations up and we're understanding just because it hasn't quite worked in that game, we can't then change everything. We need to understand if we're supporting change with players under pressure, that takes time. So it's understanding to be patient. And, and as Ian was saying there, is understanding that we're sharing this all the time with the players. So the players understanding, OK, it's organic. We're planning, we're strategizing, we're evaluating, but we're we're prepared to review. We're a, prepared to adapt but they understand actually the coach there's some thought there's a parameter to work on he's just not clutching at straws and being emotionally led and reacting too quickly because of a scoreline for the odd game I, where Mark's coming from is again some of the things I was thinking about in advance of some of the questions you sent us Gary if you look at a spectrum coach who just literally goes out and makes it up um, I think we, we've seen extreme examples of that and then we've seen extreme examples of the over planner, way too rigid. And I think Mark makes a really important point for all the, the listeners is, is you have to be prepared to ride with the punches. So in the, in the absolute grassroots level, you plan for 12 kids, um, 11 show up at uh, the time, the 12th one comes half an hour later and two leave before the end of training. If the coach is throwing a tantrum, stomping around, a tremendous disservice to the 10 players that were there and really is is making it a very coach-centric challenge and not reflecting to the needs of the players. So I think I think this need to be flexible, um, adaptable, ready must happen at the very highest levels, but it certainly happens at the grassroots level. That said, if I look at the example um, from last week and, and maybe some of the people on the single of the, the Spurs-Ajax game, now, I have no idea whether Pochettino had prepared the players of Spurs for a formation change after 20 minutes. So we don't know that, or at least I don't know that. However, the impression you got watching it on television, the impression you got perhaps from the body language of the athletes was this was something that was sort of pulled out of thin air. And that might be very unkind to that coach, but that's what I think players really dislike is they've not been prepared some of the things we throw at them so you know if if we're even a grassroots coach and we think we've got four different formations and seven different systems make sure the players know what that is don't just suddenly wake up one morning and ask them to do something 
that you haven't prepared them for. And that, that's huge, Ian, isn't it? It's that point of saying, look, two things into that is understanding it's we owe it to our players to develop a, a no fear type environment. So when we play and we're saying, look, we're only asking you to do what we know you can do. We're not going to throw anything else in that's additional to take you out of your performance potential type mindset. So it's one of the things is that we always have to ask ourselves is, are we learning-led or teacher-led in training? What I mean by that is, are we working on a principle of, okay, so we've been through this, but in a training environment now, I need to step away and give some scenarios to the players under a level of speed and open play to see if they can recall it and apply, apply it without the need for me. And not just in that session, but let's slip it into the next session without reminding them. So one, it's giving you confidence as a coach. Yes, they can do it. And secondly, it's giving the players confidence. And now, coach hasn't reminded us and we've made the right choice and committed in these situations. So that that's where we have to make the connection to the game because so often we see coaches that they're running stuff. They're running so many plays, but they're kind of ABC plays in training. But actually, all the players are doing is, coach, what do you want me to do in this moment? So it's short-term recall. It's kind of playing by numbers a little bit, even in open play. And then the coach is a little bit annoyed that actually the players can't apply the same principles with what's coming up in front of them, i.e. adapting to the opposition live in the game. So it's it's really important that we make we, we set up training to be as effective to allow the success percentage to be increased in the gameplay. Yeah, this is something I um, I think, you know, again, you were asking questions, Gary, about how the coach gets there. I think very often, you know, experience, just the simple volume of time is part of it. And an interesting parallel in the coach education world, and uh, many of the people listening will have been through Coach Ed uh, with an assessment at the end of it. The candidates, the, the, the people coming to the courses are often very stressed out about what the assessment looks like and what do the instructors really want and how do I give that in, that instructor back what he or she wants. And then, of course, on the courses, we have bad weather. We have uh, athletes don't show up for the demo sessions and the meals aren't prepared at the right time. And so previously, we made these changes on the courses. They were the correct changes, but we never articulated that to the candidates. What we do now is every Every time we make a change in a coaching education program uh, in real time, we'll explain to them why we've made this change in their best interests, because we're going to give them a little bit more rest or because it will give them more time to prepare their sessions. And I think to Mark's point, be it in the coach ed world, in my case, um, or in the, the world of performance with your athletes, the more you can be appropriately open with them and expressing, I think, I think creates a level of trust again where the athletes now prepared to run through a wall for, for you and for the group because they, they've been empowered to do so. And they're not looking over their shoulder wondering what, where the trick is. Staying on that connection there between the, the training and the game and linking everything together, let's say that training was very good the week before, both with the preparation for the opponent and the session design. Is there any disadvantage of repeating the same session week after week when things go well? Are you leading your players down a path then of maybe static thinking when it comes to the game? If it worked for one opponent, it'll work for the next. What's your what's your thoughts on that? Uh, just real real quick. Um, the first thing I would do if a player challenged me and said we've done this before is, uh, again, uh, very much I'm thinking of some of your grassroots listeners, is have we done it? really well before have we done it with this level of intensity or this level of performance outcome um i think it, certainly at the grassroots level the, the one of the things i see a lot is coaches want to create drills or activities to demonstrate their knowledge and because they have this notion that they're keeping it fresh for the athlete i think sometimes athletes like consistency they like steadiness so if 80 percent of the time the first warm-up activity is a rondo that's good. And then, you know, once in a while, you throw something in a little bit different, a different type of activity. But I think, if anything, I would suggest to coaches perhaps to stay the course a bit more yeah. with training protocols. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Mark mentioned it quickly. Just Mark, sorry, Mark. Uh, Mark said it too. You know, if you throw out, you throw out the plan every time you have a minor setback, what kind of plan was it? So you have to see through some adversity. Uh, as well as success with your plans before you can evaluate their, their efficacy. 
And that's that's linked into what Ian was saying. Is I always use that simple phrase of we are where we are and we're ready when we're ready. So I want I want players to have the confidence to challenge me, but it's based on coaches need to be really confident in being challenged and ask the question of value to why. So remember, we do things for a need, not for a want. So if the players say, look, we're ready, why are we doing this again? Then you just have the conversation. Okay, so let's set up a scenario then. Great. So let's open play. Let's set some scenarios up, some situations. Let's run it. Let's agree what success would be under high pressure in a game situation. Okay, let's give it a go. And if we're nailing it, you're right. We're ready to move on. But if we're not, you can review as players and let me know, coach, we're not ready yet. Okay, so what's working, what's not? What do we need to continue to pursue? They'll tell us, great, off we go. So it's it, it's really important where coaches have developed that type of dialogue where, yes, they're still in charge, but there's back to the value there's back to the value so if players saying we're ready so well let's put some scenarios in place and let's test it let's check it no problem and then you have that evaluation again so it's all about don't change things for the sake of it there's a journey you're taking players on that they need to be part of so that there should be real value in what you're doing and it doesn't have to be different every time it just has to be at the level of of stress variation according to the needs of the players in front of you which may need to adapt in one session based on the skill levels moving on to then preparation for the next opponents it's even in my experience for sure this is traditionally a very coach-led process with scouting reports session design this is what we're going to expect this is how we're going to prepare now as much as i reflect on it and much as i would like to to change it how can coaches modify this to create more player ownership more responsibility without their understanding of who's up next well one of the things um we're starting to see quite a lot in the youth uh, sport environment here is um, not only the use of video because now video capture and video analysis if you will is is affordable and available to the, the broadest level of the game is is having players evaluate their own performances including using video so there is some degree of ownership there and they can report back to you um, you know I I I think we can all remember a time when you brought all 26 athletes in and made them watch 45 minutes of the first half. And now, what a monumental waste of time that was. So, in a, in a good performance environment, I'm bringing individuals or small groups in of, of highly uh, edited footage. But at the grassroots level, you can Dropbox or we transfer your athletes' video, and they have the ability now, young players, to send you two or three clips and maybe ask you a question or reflect on their performance. So I think, again, even from the grassroots through, those are some of the tools to, to turn it back to, if you will, athlete empowerment. Yeah, I think there's a few key things with that. If you think about it, you look at any sport um, that's that interactive hockey, netball, basketball, soccer, etc. is actually there's only so many ways that you can play in transition attack and defense there's, there's not a huge leap of them so the next thing that you're looking at is okay are there individual units of certain players that do certain things outside tradition and then is how good are they at doing what they do so the challenge is always is if we're developing an environment where actually we're always adapting into ways of play putting scenarios in that are different to see how the players can actually just adapt as part of our ongoing long-term development one that's better for their long-term development as a player not just in that season for their for their careers but also it's it's taken away the challenge of all we need to do is raise our awareness so that can be the video but it's this discussion and making sure if it's certain people in certain positions that actually they're the people we ask the relevancy so we don't throw everything at everyone is it more relevant to you yes well can you show me that now because the challenge always is is even in a game play we now know that the chances are we can't set up that play live well enough to challenge ourselves in our practice environment because unless it's similar to how we play we're not going to be as skilled at doing it as the opposition so often it's about how can we develop a training environment that's always adaptive always getting people to look in front to actually understand the basic fundamentals of different ways to play we can practice that continually so all we have to do then is raise our awareness to little critical adjustments on how they play to allow us to be more confident as opposed to 
just have long conversations about, well, this team does this and Jimmy does this and this guy in this position does this. So the chances are they won't remember. And secondly, they won't be able to apply anyway. So sometimes it's stripping, stripping it back and keeping it really simple and then go, OK, so what can we bring alive in training that's going to just raise our awareness to make them more confident about making decisions with what's in, in front of us, if that makes sense? Yeah, and I, I think back, Gary, to something we talk about a lot, the, the award that used to be called the National Youth License. There was a little mantra in there, which was clear, clear, concise, and relevant. And I think, I mean, I still use that now when I'm working with adults or, or high-level athletes. If I can make myself pretty, pretty transparent, I can keep it blissfully short, and I can make it relevant to them, then I've done a pretty good job. So this clear, concise, and relevant. Again, back to back to making my 26th player on my roster watch 45 minutes of, of last week's game. I, why would I? Why? Why? Why did I do that? And I still question myself now. I, I have no idea what I was thinking. But bringing in maybe the the backup fullback who knows that at certain situations he's much better value than having him sit with me for seventy five minutes, and we're talking about all things under the sun. Well, what's great there, Ian, isn't it? It's depending on where you are in the journey, of course. But we want to develop players, even at young ends, that can actually look at things, analyse things in a simple way and then share that with themselves and the group. So just giving those players, OK, can you just look at this five, ten minutes and just tell me what you see? Or just pick this one player and could you share that with the group when we come back of what you've noticed in that area? It's giving them something like back to your clear point, but it's actually still getting them to think and get them engaged in, and because they're sharing with the group, we know one of the best ways to learn is to to teach, is is continuing that dialogue. So it's not the coach sharing and telling, it's actually players sharing peer to peer, they're learning and how can we bring that alive to link it back into application, not just I can talk about it, but I can't show you type of thing. So it's kind of show me the answer as opposed to just tell me. We'll just take a quick break there. Youth coaches, think about some of your biggest challenges. One that I hear frequently is the amount of time you have with your players. Have you ever finished a session only to realize that you didn't progress to the point that you had hoped to get to? That is exactly why we're excited about the work being done by Sports Lab 360, a company with a great backstory and an even better product. As a coach, you can use the platform to make assignments focused on specific tactical principle, put in custom notes and track progress and scoring of your players. Coaches who have used the program report more productivity and progression in training with players, not only arriving more educated, but also with a greater desire to learn and grow on the soccer IQ side of the game. They are excited to offer Modern Soccer Coach listeners 15% off team or club subscriptions with the code ROADSHOWPROMO1 or send them a note and tell them that Gary sent you to get an extra week on your free trial. Sports Lab 360, please check them out. Back to Ian and Mark. Set pieces in training, source of much boredom throughout football at every level, I think. How can we improve that, make it more interesting, more engaging, or do you feel that aspects like focus, concentration should be respected or even taught from even young players in the game? What's your thoughts on that? Let's talk about football briefly. So I think that the probably... Um, and Mark can certainly speak to the needs of rugby athletes and, and the types of set play there. Um, and then you, I think when you get into some of the more choreographed sports, if you will, um, be even stronger. But just personal experience with, with football, um, at any value, the value to the attacking team of, of potential value of set plays, a potential threat to, to the, the defending team, they have to be addressed. Um, listening to some of the commentary on NBC of the EPL and some of the ex-pros talk about these were typically done the day before competition where it was low physical impact and so they could you know get a little bit more thoughtful and walk through them but but to a to an athlete you don't find too many people in the soccer world that love practicing set plays um, just my personal approach to it so I just share my personal approach um, at the college environment the life of a, an athlete with us is four years so we had a modest, uh, a modest playbook, if you will, which was brought out at the beginning of every season, and the seniors and the juniors were teaching the freshmen and the sophomores and the reminders, uh, and the, uh, with the reminders. And then we had some vocabulary, and we had some some other signals which could keep everybody on track. Um, 
And then when we practice set plays, we practice them in as competitive an environment as we could for bite-sized pieces of time, 15, 20 minutes. We wouldn't be doing those for a whole session. So I think everybody has their own answer, but I, I'm sort of towards that less is best if the quality of the work is, is high quality. Yeah, I'd agree with Ian on that. One of the things we've always got to look at with, with everything in training is, is the level of quality and intent good enough to actually provide us with the challenge we want to establish where we are. So if we start just going through the motions with things, it's not real anyway. So I've seen so many times, and I, I think hockey is probably one of the sports um, that actually set plays are high scoring. Games are won so much by their set plays, especially on their corners. And the, there are other sports also. I mean, we, we see some of the horrendously long playbooks in, in soccer and in basketball that they can't live out anyway. But it always boils down to, in the training environment, one, have they connected with the value? But secondly, have we put a level of intent, a level of excellence when it comes to the commitment and the engagement of the players? Well, we can actually test it anyway. So by keeping it short to ensure that they have the value, but always baseline it first. So open play, put a set piece scenario in, just see it live. So we're not loading it up. We're saying this is reality and then getting the players to re-evaluate, re re okay, where were we with that within our commitment and our effectiveness? So then we can regress it back, right, we definitely need to work on it, but keep it short enough so we're getting the level of engagement and commitment we need to really test the attack and the defence. Otherwise, don't bother doing it because it's not real. It's, you're not getting anything from it. Oh, yeah, I think um, a great sort of uh, man in the street example, if you will, for the coaches out there that they, they insist on practicing penalty kicks, right? So... You may be entering a tournament, penalty kicks could be a real thing that could happen. So for some obscure reason, all 18 of your players take them in a kind of a half-baked way with the spare goalkeeper hanging on the post, which is a massive distraction to the goalkeeper who's in. So why do that? Why not just take the three to five guys that you know could be put in that position, take them to one side, give them three solid reps using a full-size penalty box that looks like a penalty box you can't replicate the crowd you can't replicate or you can't adequately replicate the, the crowd and the, the pressure but make it quality make it this is a penalty kick you've got three of them show me how you're going to convert them for me on saturday as opposed to having your backup goalkeeper who's taking penalty kicks and, and everybody's just looking around going like what are we doing and then having it in um, context as well ian isn't it it's having the context of okay so you're rarely going to do a penalty when you've just come out of a warm-up. It's normally after you've been through a hard phase of the game. I and mean, if it's at the end of the game, obviously, there's that level of fatigue. But your heart is in live play. You've had a pause. Now you have to focus and get yourself into the right commitment level to then make a choice and commit to it. So how can we replicate that as close as we can in training and not just, so, OK, guys, you've done the warm-up. Now we're going to do some penalties for five minutes. It's... Are we smart enough on how we can get it as close to the real life as we can in how we're going to approach it and the intent and putting some level of quantifiability? Okay, so how can we load some pressure onto this? Whether it's, I mean, I've seen, I know some people laugh at this, but I've seen where they've said, okay, so you, you're going to have to share your mobile phone for 30 seconds with another player and they can text what they want. You know, these type things really, wow, I don't want to miss this anymore. So, you know, it's playing smart in what are the things that the players will be uncomfortable with. Okay, let, let's let's agree something now to make it as real as we can to really get them to go, right, now now I've got a bit of fear of failure. I can't just cruise through this. I've got to nail it. So my focus intent needs to be on what I want to do now, and I have to commit to it, which is more game-like. I would say just, again, before we go too far down the path, there's, there's certainly times during the season, different times when you have a session which is – mental rest physical rest it can be of a recreational nature you can consciously plan something which really doesn't have a specific directed performance outcome but i think what what mark and i are talking about is the majority of time is being efficient with your use of time thinking about what the what the outcome is going to be where, where you want to be and talking about that so i'm not suggesting i don't I think either of us is suggesting it has to be this sort of draconianly uh, planned out, mapped out thing all the time. Majority of time, I think we're just not, I don't think we're tight enough with our use of time, which is why you see these training sessions for young players that are going into the 90 minutes, an hour and 45, 
and I just I really struggle with the efficiency of that and um, and I just think coaches sometimes we throw too much at it without uh, without good forethought yeah and there's two things to that Ian isn't there is is, is often a, a 60 minute 45 hour session of quality is more enjoyable for the players there's more engagement there's more quality from it than stretching it I I know even at senior level and pro level is sometimes when players know there's a two-hour session, their engagement isn't there, and actually their game's not two hours, so it's 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 not really in any connection. But the other thing is to that is letting players know, okay, guys, this is a learning phase or this is a performance phase. Now you could have three or four of them in a session at different phases, but the players know, okay, it's a learning phase. The environment's different. The expectations are different. We can start. We can ask questions. We can walk it through. We, we can work through this. There's no expectation of outcome on this. If it's a performance phase, we know what it is. Coach is not stepping in. He's not rating. It's right. There's situations there, and we're going at it. And you might have, might have five, ten minutes of a performance phase. But it's giving the players an understanding of clarity of what's the expectation for this phase to allow them to understand what's expected of them. Let's talk about then as you're approaching the weekend, picking the team for Saturday, different ways to do it, but what's your thoughts on the best, I suppose, in terms of timing initially? And then secondly, honesty, the level of honesty that you should have with players who are maybe not in your plans? Great question. I think back to uh, my college days where we would put the team sheet up uh, maybe the night before or two days before, and it was you, everybody went to the the whiteboard and or the the clipboard, and you saw your lineup. And I, I quite like that. There's something nostalgic and and pleasant about that. I think when you look at and I, I was thinking about this again in advance of the call, you're a top level manager. You've got a squad of 26 high paid athletes, but you've got 50, 60 games, so you can't keep them all happy all the time. But you've you've got a pretty good situation as opposed to a youth coach maybe with 16 to 18 players, only 20 games, and there's a great disparity of of potential talent through your group. So I I tend to believe that players have a pretty good idea of the rank level of their ability within the squad, uh, even at the youth level. I think where it gets distorted is perhaps parental information or the interjection of friends or girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever it is. Um, So... My general feeling is that the majority of my college players, my youth players, they know what the lineup is going to be. I've got to be very clear, explain why that is the lineup that, that I've chosen to select. I've got to suggest what the contribution of my, my substitutes might, might be, perhaps being somewhat specific, but also somewhat generalities too. And then everybody has to understand if they're going to get a position on the bench, that to some extent in my culture is a privilege. So if, if you don't want to be an effective bench player and I have to establish that culture, then you can go on the other side and sit in the stand and, and that's a decision you can make. Um, but in general, I, I, I like to give my players the information a good, at least one sleeping night before the game so that people can get in the right form of, uh, get their heads where they need to be. I think this really links into the importance of the type of culture you've developed. Um, and this is where we can't underestimate developing a very effective culture. My my thought is always that um, players and coaches need to understand they need to be both selfish and selfless, but the understanding of the meaning to that. So selfish is I'm going to do everything I can to be the best player I can be within my training, my nutrition, my skill, my practice, my intent, my engagement, because I want to get picked. But being selfless is understands that, especially with the age group, a year difference can be huge in the journey of competency. And I understand someone may be picked in front of me for this game, but, but I'm cool with that so long as the coach, and this is a critical thing, is 100% honest with me all the time, all the way through, and doesn't make stuff up. Um, because as soon as you make stuff up, it gets found out the credibility is out the window. So set the, set the culture up. is Not everyone is going to get picked all the time. And this is about a journey, and we're all at different stages of our journey. But I'll support you to help you be the best player you can be along this journey this season. And I'm going to be honest with you and understand why we pick certain people. But be ready if you're not picked to support the people around you to be the best they can be on the day. So sometimes I'll give, and this is where I've seen different, I've seen some like Ian saying where it's, you know, the night before. But I've seen some on the four or five days before 
and then we've, they've given them different roles. So now you're the opposition role, but hey, there's still an opportunity if you get picked if the, the other person is pursuing the level of excellence we've said in engagement and commitment to things. But also they're given like assistant coach roles. So, okay, can you work on this, help this? How can we help with the scouting here? How can you share these things? So the, the critical point is, is no players then thinking, well, my week's done now. I've still got a role and I'm still selfishly pursuing my excellence to be the best I can be. But selfishly, selflessly, how can I help the team be the best they can be on game day? What can my part be in this? And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about developing effective culture. You know, I think your role players, maybe your bench players, they have to trust that you are evaluating all the time and you're yeah. prepared to give opportunity where it's deserved. I'll, I'll give one uh, true story. Um, uh, a coach I'm familiar with um, had a policy that you didn't lose your position due to injury. So that's that's fair enough. People have that type of policy. Um, but the, the, the player that he was looking to make the biggest change within the squad happened to be the one that got injured. So when the player came back fully fit, the coach um, essentially made up a story as to why the player wasn't going to play in the very next game. And it had to do with a, a personnel matchup. And he just felt that this player was not quite that, that player. And then the player didn't play for the rest of the season. So the coach had created some expectations and then essentially, for want of a better expression, had lied. Or has certainly, not intentionally, but it ended up becoming a big lie and at that point you've lost you clearly you've lost the player but you've also lost the player's immediate friends on the team and ultimately the word has gone through the team that the notion of in this case uh you don't lose your position on the basis of an injury was was false so i think you know to mark's essential point yeah. honesty is has got to be the the center pinning of this how much you choose to reveal is going to be personal right some of us are quite open and quite effusive and and, and want a very engaged and open. And others are going to be a bit more circumspect and pull players to the side in different ways. But I think of the, the underpinning of it has to be that nugget of, of, of honesty and integrity. Now, and the other thing linked into this, of course, is Garani, and is that what success to you as a coach, especially on the earlier age groups, is if we're so focused on results sometimes, we're missing the point of why we should be coaching on the age group development is... We need to understand that we're there as a service provider for the players, so we want to help them grow and develop. So often, if we're just focused on, I need to put the team out that's going to win every single game, we're, we're inhibiting the growth of the younger players. So that's where we've got to look at the long-term journey. And so players to get better need to play in competitive games. So I can't continue to put, continue my first team out. And now, now I'm not developing the players underneath me. I've got to wait for some to leave. And then all of a sudden, a year later, and you're now getting picked. So it's understanding for a coach and the whole organization, what is success for us? And then I need to honor that and know, not just always pick to win the game. So I think that's an important question coaches need to ask themselves. And sometimes we, we, we don't ask ourselves that question about the development of the players. Moving on to the game itself, then this I, I'm fascinated by this here about you know what you feel would be the role, especially in the youth game. What should the role of a coach be in terms of body language, in terms of how they conduct themselves? Loud, quiet, sitting, standing. What, you know, I know a lot of it depends on the personality of the coach, but is there is there an optimal way a coach should act during the game, especially at the youth level? At the youth level, coaches should enjoy watching high level pro coaching and then don't emulate it <laughs> because uh, because unfortunately a lot of our coaches um, you know well Mourinho does it or Guardiola does it or Peter Vermees does it um, but they're, they're uh, in a slightly different environment than the average youth coach I, I, um, I believe that the actions of the coach in the youth environment in that, in that sort of grassroots quite Local impact the attitudes and behaviors of the fans. Certainly, are the uh, bench is aware of it because the young kids are looking at the back of the coach as he or she moves about, and I, I think it gets across to the the kids in the middle. But I, I definitely feel like the agitated, animated coach empowers the agitated, animated parent group too. Um, if you've done preparation, can you not sit on the bench and watch the results of your preparation and then make adjustments? half time or legitimate pauses why do we have to manipulate right from the beginning so for me 
um, rather see, I'd rather see the somewhat, uh, the coach that the parents might question, what, where's, where's the value? But the value should have been in the preparation and then the thought and evaluation and analysis the coach is giving by sitting quietly. Yeah, I mean, I mean this is a big area on, on, on my work is, is getting coaches to be more aware of their own emotional intelligence. So I've seen so many coaches across so many sports, all the way up to elite pro level, international team level is, the coach in a training environment, uh, sometimes I see, and it's a beautiful work of art, you see the way they're interacting, they're mindful of the state, they're changing their tone and questioning and what they're saying and when they step back with diff in individuals, different pressure loads, they get into a game and they've lost all awareness of their emotional state and they're just getting caught up in the game. So now instead of being a positive impact on the performance of the players, they're now a negative impact on the performance of the players. So I always look at it and, and I would say this is where, as you said, Ian, don't emulate the senior levels because often I think actually the senior level, they're ineffective. So what we've got to understand is that what they can't do at senior level is they can't speak to every spectator and parent, etc. to go, look, this is why I'm coaching this way. This is what you're going to see with me on game time to get them bought into the whole principle of how can I help your player, your child, whoever it is, play the best they can be. Where well, I need to be mindful of my state. And in this moment now, am I going to be part of a problem or part of a solution and manage the way I communicate with different players and understand different players, you need to communicate differently when they're under pressure and state. So it's really, I kind of see it as three caps. So one cap is when in a training environment, when it's a learning, the cap, the cap a coach has to wear is, well, you know, I've got some information, you haven't got some, well, let's see if you can figure out, am I here to help and support you? Cap two is if you're in a performance part of training where you're saying, right, now I'm going to aim to catch you out. So I'm going to load the pressure on. I'm going to make some bad ref calls. I'm going to take your opposition to a side in training and trying to catch you out. And you go, Jimmy, I wind Jimmy up, Steve. You know what to do. Stay within the rules and step back. Set that mayhem in place. But in a game, my cap is I need to be the positive influencer of the players around me to help them play to their best. In order for me to do that, I need to be really good at my emotional intelligence, my aware of my state and how to regulate the state. Because if I'm not, I'm now not an effective coach because I'm being emotionally led, I'm not in charge and being aware and making informed decisions of how I can have a positive impact on the players. And there was a, there's a, you know, there's a wonderful example, a legendary basketball coach, college basketball coach here, um, ended his career. He was legendary, won lots of games, but under a cloud of, bad behavior and just kind of lost it. His successor, a young coach, came in and said the first problem he had when he worked with the team was when they made an error on the court, they immediately would turn and look to see the reaction of the coach, whether he was going to throw a chair or berate them or sub them. And what do we as coaches really want our players to do when an error occurs in a game? This adversity, we want them to respond quickly with a, with a positive solution. And so the culture the coach had created towards the end of his career was, was the antithesis of, of, of the performance goals he wanted because the players were so triggered to the actions of the coach. And, and I think to Mark's point, it's this, it's this understanding as a coach, where do, I want, where do I want to be with my group at the end of the season? How do I want, how do I want to reflect on my season? How do I want my athletes to reflect on their season? And if if I have made myself the center of that show, if that's what I want, then um, maybe get out of youth sports, get out of uh, certainly get out of grassroots sports because um, you've kind of lost the plot. And it's back to that, Ian, isn't it? In that case of we don't want the tail wagging the dog. So we don't want coaches on the sideline thinking, well, this is how I'm expected to act because the parents and the people expect of me to be inverted, common as passionate. And they have to be robust enough to say, actually, no, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hanker to what's expected of me. I, I'm going to do what I believe is the right thing to do for the good and benefit of my players. But I need to ask myself, what does that look like? So we're back to again at the very beginning is if you can, film yourself in a game type situation and watch yourself back to ask yourself are you even aware of how you're communicating and in my experience over the last 28 years i'd say 99 percent of coaches are so inaccurate of, of what they think they're doing in a game and what they're actually doing so establishing a baseline is critical and then you can start 
asking yourself some self questions about what type coach do I want to be and how effective do I want to be for the players in training and in games. Okay, last one. Finishing up the busy week then, personal development. All coaches are, are extremely busy these days. What should coaches be doing personally to make sure that they are progressing, developing, so that education is not an event that happens for a week every summer, it's a continuous process? I can only, I can't quote to be the elite managers who have 10, 11 month seasons, the media, the newspapers, how do you get away from it? I think in the grassroots level, um, the, the young woman or the young man, um, husband, wife, mum, dad, who, who um, see the kids twice a week and then coach them on the Saturday, they may think that that's the level of their necessary attention. Um, I, you know, I, I, I consider there three types of general education as a coach. You have formal, you go to the courses, you get badges. Semi-formal, you go to clinics, you listen to podcasts, things like that. And then the, the informal is going uh, for a coffee with a, with a colleague after the training session. So, you know, in the grassroots environment, typically the coach heads home with their son or daughter, and that's the end of it. They're not really involved in a club. They're involved in a team that has no connection to any other person. But, but from my, for what I like to do is I like, I like time by myself. I like time with colleagues, with peers. Obviously, sometimes people are a little bit more experienced. Certainly, uh, a lot of time with people who are less experienced. And just the process of thinking um, as much as possible. I think it comes with experience and tweaking and being ultimately being comfortable enough to say, this is the way I've always done it. And now I've got to rethink that. Um, you know, the, the, that's, that for me is the, is, the, is the biggest thing, is that self-awareness, um, the emotional intelligence to, be, to, to say, you know, I've done it this way for a long time, but a little tweak here will improve it. I think we can... You know, you want to have your best training session uh, 30 minutes before you shuffle off your mortal coil. That's what I'm aspiring to. Is, is my best training session is, is still 15 years in the future. My best performance, whether it's a win or a loss, my best coaching performance and, and performance of my athletes is 15, 20 years in my future. It, it isn't today, if you will. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember that we always should be developing the person first and the player. And it's exactly the same with the coach. So the coach should be thinking about developing themselves as a person, then coach. And if we think about a person of themselves, of, you know, are they in a good place? You know, back to that point, that emotional intelligence stuff about, but also coaching often at grassroots and the elite level is about how, how effective you are as an influencer, how you can influence the players in a positive way so they can do what you want them to do in a way you want them to do it without the need for you and that's even a game you're on the sideline sitting back my work is done but sometimes we get so caught up in searching for the next magical technical or tactical watching youtube or you know watching some pro level game you know how can i increase my tactical and technical but often that's not the area that's going to make you a happier person but also make you a, a more effective coach and person is actually it's the influencer part and I, I'm a big believer in just finding someone who's a peer that can be, uh, it's good if they're a teacher or a coach, but somebody that understands about the same principle of developing the person first and the coach, the influencer, and just have that engagement and support. So to plan it in as if it's a timetable, plan it in as if it's a scheduled meeting in your week. And at least once a week, you'll have some face time with someone that can invest in you and talk about you that can then link into the coaching. Often when I've seen coaches, even at elite level, start internally spiraling down or lose the enjoyment for the game and their role is, they've never had somebody that FaceTime weekly where can give them that air where they can talk about stuff, but also help reset them. So if, if you were to do anything, I'd say look at you as the person first and then look at you as the influencer, but then find someone that you can go, let's make this a weekly thing. So it's going to help you, but also obviously if they're a coach teacher, it can help them as well. I'd say that's free, but it, you get such a return from that. Is that is that alongside then you know, dealing with the pressure as well and the stress? Because that's that's coming at all levels today, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I yeah, think I, it's I all linked. Say, in. Sure. Go on, Ian. No, I, you know, no, when I was a younger coach, um, we had a bad training session. I came home. 
I sat on the couch with a with a beer, and my wife at the time um, was working on the computer, and she she said, you know, is there anything I can do to help you out? And I said, no. When I come home like this, just let me have a beer, and I'll decompress by myself. Um, so I just told the person that loved me the most in the world that she couldn't help me. Um, that that was a I didn't realize at the time I was probably in my early twenties, but now uh, some. What a stunning failure of self-awareness and awareness of the people around me. Um, so I, you know, I'm 100% with Mark on this. You, you can you can study, you can go to all the courses, you can read all the books, but if you don't know how it fits your context, if you don't know how it impacts the people around you, and you don't occasionally find the opportunity to express frustration or your feeling of success with a peer, somebody within the club, an assistant coach, uh, maybe maybe going out with somebody you've competed with uh, um, in the competition. So two U14 teams, and you both have the chance to go for a, for a cocktail afterwards or a cup of coffee and just talk about, because I think coaches feel, very often coaches, I think, tend to feel lonely, um, especially the head coach. And we shouldn't, I think once you get into that cycle, you stop growing and you actually diminish um, when you cycle into your own uh, private world. Yeah, I, I'd agree on the same with Ian, is, is that point, especially when he gets that head coach role, is don't, don't close off the doors around you. Actually, you need to be searching for opening more because you need, some, you need someone to challenge you in everything you do. You need some quantifiability. You need someone you can vent with, but also someone that's going to keep you in check. Um, in both ways, when your ego is getting a bit too high, but also when you're starting to negative spiral down. Where someone, I mean, I'll give you a great example is there's so many sessions where a coach, either a game or a, a training session has come away and have said, oh, I'm horrendous. That was the worst session. It's eating them up. But actually, when someone's asked them a few questions, we go, let's just look back and ask that. It's, it's actually been a really effective session. They've just got caught up in the moment. So just having that conversation with someone, and you need, I mean, it's great when you can find someone that's got nice, good ears, that can actually listen, keep context, ask you. But find someone who go, I'm giving you permission to challenge me. I'm giving you permission to be really honest with me because that's what I need to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, and when we don't have that, that's when things start to become tough. So remember, pressure is self placed so when we're on our own we have no one to, to lift us up no one to kick us in the butt so having somebody to the side is has to be the number one priority for every every coach every parent every manager every teacher brilliant ian mark thank you so much for coming on oh it's been a pleasure gary i mean thanks for the opportunity to share i mean it's um there's so many um, coaches out there. I know a lot of podcasts are technical and tactical, but it's it's really refreshing to get the opportunity to share about the the human factor in coaching and not not just getting caught up in all the play stuff. Yeah, there's no doubt the the elite managers I've had the opportunity to meet in the seven years I've been doing this job. And Mark obviously meets a lot more elite performers than I do, but um, that, that seems to be the increasing common thread is is some degree of self awareness and humanity. This type of this type of emotional intelligence discussion, reflection, self awareness, I think is is critical, and I, and I don't think it's the exclusive realm of of the high the, the elite level. I think this has to be a discussion at the grassroots level, at the mum and dad level, where you can you can take a deep breath, just enjoy coaching children instead of responding to the needs and demands of maybe the parent group or some some false expectation you've created. So I, I like talking about this stuff. Thanks so much to Ian and Mark for their time and insight. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, a lot of great stuff there from, from both. I uh, suppose I will break it in two just to review from my side of things. The things that I took from, from Mark, asking yourself the tough questions about is your environment teacher-led or learning-led? And as much as we like to think that our environments are player-driven, I think a lot of them point towards teacher-led and that's where he's saying short-term recall, you're playing by numbers, but when it's learning-led, that's when it becomes adapting to opposition, being flexible. 
and increasing the percentages of getting it right in the game and not just increasing the percentages of the exercise working or everything looking good in training and I thought that was brilliant from Ian's insight kind of tying them both together the the main takeaway for me was that balance between flexibility and consistency and you know you need consistency in your culture you need consistency in your messaging you need consistency in your environment because players need to know you know what are the main things what do we stand for who are we what's my role in this here but then you also then need to create flexibility to make them adaptable and make them robust and make them able to solve problems and getting that right is very 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 difficult but I think the process of asking yourself tough questions the process of listening to other people have ideas can really help and really benefit you as a coach I really like Dean's mantra with the youth award clear concise relevant wrote that down on my notebook and I'll be taking that in everything that I want to do on you know, this week moving forward and putting stuff together with my work I want to make sure it's got those things clear concise relevant he also mentioned efficient use of time and I just think that do we look at environments being somewhat static do we look at cultures being somewhat static again defining it the way we want to define it we have a good environment we have a good culture our players enjoy it or do we look at it from a more critical lens and say, how do I improve it? And I think that's where the key is. And I think humility, obviously, is a big, big part of coach education and development as individuals. But it's having that persistence to look all the time and saying, what can we improve? What can we improve? So a lot of different ideas there from Mark and Ian. And, and I think it's, it's a really good exercise to almost sit down with your staff and break down every aspect of player development, game preparation, picking the team, review process, every single aspect of the program and saying, is this good enough? Can we improve it? Especially in the summer months that we're now having maybe a month or two away from our team, getting those processes in order before they come into their pre-season, I think are crucial. So really enjoyed it. As always, we'd love to hear your thoughts at Gary Kernin on Instagram, at Gary Kernin on Twitter. Really appreciate you listening to the podcast. Really appreciate you spreading the word. Have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernin on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.